How many reasons do we have today to give blessings to the Lord? How many reasons? Oh, well, you read the bulletin with 10,000 reasons. Oh, let's, let's sing with all of our hearts today.
participate in that uh, through the through the bottle campaign. Uh, so let's give Jane a welcome today. Thank you. Good morning. Good to be with you again. Good to be anywhere outside again, actually. Um, <laughs> but no, no. It's good to be here. Hi. Uh, wanted to give you an update. And obviously it's been an unusual year. Cool how God just uh, shows us creative methods to do his will. Um, it, it stopped us in our tracks a little bit at first, but then we decided, well, it was a good soul searching time as it has been for all of us, like what's important, why are we here, that sort of thing. And just thinking about strengthening families in our community. And that's what we're about. We're about care for life and the families care for life. And so we, we had to think, okay, how can we reach these families? They're cooped up in their homes. A lot of them are out of work, the kids are home, there's lots of stresses, and what do we do? We have this right now media, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, okay. So we have, we have access to right now media, which we can give to all of our clients, and we've been doing that over the years, but we thought, how great, they're all home on the internet, they can be affording themselves these uh, relationship, I'm sorry, relationship building videos, these parenting videos, these life skills videos, um, right there on their phone, right there on their devices. So we reached out in letter form to about 250 clients and sent out these letters with the Right Now Media cards that had the access of how to get on if they hadn't already, and encouraged them to do those things. We also did some phone calling just to check up on people, some of our regular clients. Um, then we did some emergency supplies. The, keep doing that. The uh, diapers, the formula, we even had some car seats that um, if, if you have a newborn, you can't leave the hospital without a car seat. And Kiwanis gives us new car seats, uh, which is part of our earning and learning program that people earn. So we were able to help people out with a couple car seats. Um, there was some emergency clothing that's, that a gal needed. So just some unique situations. And we did it very safely with the new building. We have a foyer. 
So there's an outside door, there's a foyer, there's an inside door. So we were able to do these things by appointment only. We would get their uh, items together, put them in the foyer on the table. They would sign the form, leave. We'd lock the door again, sanitize everything, get ready for the next person. So isn't that cool how way, way in advance paved the way? And even now that we're opened up again, which we are fully opened up again, we can do things so much safer because we have an in-desk and an out-desk, the check-in, check-out desk now. We can separate people. We can we have five client rooms down the hall. So they, they, we can keep people separated from each other and sanitize things in between and do things safely, do the temperature check and the <clears throat> ask the questions as they come in. And everything is by appointment only. So we're, we're finding ways of, of um, providing the services that are so needed. They are essential and we were able to stay open this whole time. Um, in some capacity, and we're very thankful for that. So, uh, I also want to tell you another praise is we sold 213 Marshall Street uh, like a week ago. <laughs> Which is great. It's going to be a rental unit, I believe, and uh, we're just very thankful to have that checked off and gone. So, that, that's awesome. We have a, a news, there's a, there's a series called Bright Course, which we're going to be um, launching. We just got board approval for this. And this is those kind of uh, parenting videos, uh, actually hundreds of videos, that we can just text to a client. They can watch them on their phone. Um, it's, it's got a, every single lesson has a spiritual component to it, if, if that's appropriate. They still will be coming in and talking to our peer counselors and our mentors about the lesson, so there's still that relationship. But they can start right off, oh, I'm having trouble with this. Well, let me just send you this lesson and easily watch it. They can share it with others in their home that way. Um, it, and all the lessons are very current and up to date. There's not, you know, the 80s hairstyles going on or anything like that in the videos, which is really important because. Second, you see a 80s, no offense to anybody that might have an 80s hairstyle, just stick with what works for you. But if you are having that on a video and you have a 20 something year old in front of it, it's irrelevant. And now I don't care what the content is, they're not going to hear it. So we have to have relevant pieces. So this is a really cool, um, we're, and, and we're just getting used to it. We're just getting, getting to know it all, but there are even trainings for our volunteers on it. It's called Bright Course, and that's, that's just a cool thing that we're ready to launch. By the way, volunteers are always needed. Just a little plug, but we always need male and female volunteers for upfront and behind the scenes um, work. I know that people are, like I said, have reevaluated kind of what do I want to be spending my time on? What do I want on my plate? We were, I was a little afraid we were going to get our volunteers back after all this because maybe they decided, you know, this is just too much for me. I, I, I'm thinking about knocking some things off on my list um, to spend more time with family. But fortunately, they're all coming back. Um, and if you're interested in that, please let me know. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you. And speaking of getting involved, a couple of things. Life Walk and Run, your, your wonderful um, church liaison, Kathy Pike, who happens to also be now our, our board secretary. <laughs> has done a great job um, starting to promote our Life Walk and Run, which is August 1st. It's always in May. Uh, but it's August 1st this year, which might be better weather. We're going to have it outside, um, and it's at the First Baptist Church. Please, please, please consider getting involved in some way in this. If you, if you don't want to come and walk or run, which if you do, great. Sign up and, and, and do that. If you don't want to walk or run, you can come for the silent auction. You can bring little kiddos for the children's events, um, activities. There's free food. That's always good. Coffee, Big B, that's always good. So come for the fellowship, come for the, and support us in some way. If you can't make it on August 1st, but you want to get involved, you can go to our website, beginningscare.com, and register yourself as a fundraiser. So if you're on social media at all, you can make a little fun, easy account and ask your friends to give five bucks. You have your own little thermometer, and will show how you get, reach your goal. And that links into our thermometer that shows. So that's a really easy way. It's not confrontational. Can you give me some money? You know, it's just online. They can take it or leave it, but many people do say, yeah, I can give five bucks. And so that all goes to the cause. So I, I would really encourage you to, and if you don't want to do that, then you can go to my fundizy page and give me five bucks. And I would love that. 
the baby bottle campaign, which you're, you're participating in this month, so you just, if you don't know how to do it, there's a, there's a basket, there's a bassinet of baby bottles. They each have a number on the bottom. Go ahead and grab a bottle, look at the number, sign up on the sheet that's, that's there, and write down the bottle number next to your name. Take that home for this month, and just put your change or any folding money or checks or anything that you want to, you know, can, can be put in there, and then bring it back the last Sunday of July, right? July. Um, and then we will collect all those and we'll let you know what you all contributed together. It's amazing how it adds up. And this all goes to operational expenses, the electric bill, those kinds of things um, for keeping the center going. And it's amazing how these baby vital campaigns, we, we took a little hit these past few months, but, uh, but like you, so many churches are, are saying, okay, sign us up now, sign us up now for the rest of the year. But this raised like $14,000 last year all to, together. It's a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, yeah, it's so please participate in that, and we thank you for that. We, we always covet your prayers. Please pray as we're looking at some maybe staffing issues, some staffing changes. Um, right now, board membership. We have another um, person maybe applying to the board. All those things, we need God's wisdom. And then these, these of course, these programs for how to really meet the needs of the people in our community. And hopefully be a witness. Um, Show them an attractive witness of, of what Christ is like and how he can change their lives and, and, and um, help their families. So we thank you for your support very much. Thanks, Sarah. How many of you knew Beginnings Care for Life are in a new building now, downtown? Okay, half of you. Okay, so... Uh, they sold the place over there on Marshall, and they have that just that beautiful building that literally God provided. Amazing. And you may or may not know, but Kathy Pike has been on the board for Beginnings Care for a year now, or two years, or what is it? Yeah. So uh, not only our liaison, but, but just a vital part of the ministry there. So we're thankful for that as well. Um, Who's reading? All right. Let's continue on with our worship. This morning as a congregation, we'll be reading together Psalms 145, verses 1 through 7. So let's all please stand this morning as we read God's word together as a congregation. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They'll celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing your righteousness.
take out your bulletins. We've gone back to the bulletin this week because we're starting to have information that we're needing to share. And uh, so I want to highlight a couple of those things. And also inside your bulletin is that uh, connection card. And I'd like to have you fill that out. And uh, prayer request, and I'm going to go through that, uh, the back side, but you can uh, fill that out. Uh, also, if you are at home, I encourage you to get your communion ready, your bread and cup, as we will partake here in a few minutes. And also for everyone to give your offering to the Lord, uh, you can just put it in the offering plate or send it to us uh, in the mail as well. Uh, take your Bibles uh, here, if you can in a minute, turn to John chapter 6, we'll be there uh, going to that first. And in our great adventure this week, we will be reading uh, chapters... Uh, 11 through 15, and uh, doing our A, B, C, Ds. You will notice in the uh, middle of the bulletin, so I'm going to have two pieces of paper in your hand, it's talking about pray and go. We are going to be launching uh, pray and go, uh, this initiative in uh, July. I ordered 10,000 uh, door hangers. And uh, our goal as a leadership is that we are going to be praying for our community and not only generally, but over the next period of time, whether it takes us six months, whether it takes us a year, whatever it takes us, we want to pray for every home and we want to let those homes know that we are praying for them. And uh, the uh, door hanger is this size. This is just the promo for us for our pray and go. Uh, but uh, the, the door hanger will will hang, uh, and, we, and, and it's a very simple process. We uh, uh, choose a block that we're going to be walking, and we uh, walk up to the door praying for that home. And we'll put out a prayer sheet that we will be praying. You put the door hanger on the door, and then you leave, and you go to the next house and praying for that house. And, uh, and so our goal is to do that for every home in our community. The door, the door hanger says, we love our community and we're praying for our community. You know what the church did in the first century? In the first century, the church's way was they prayed and then they went or they goed. So you'd go G-O-E, not G-O-A-D, G-O-E-D. That's not even a word, is it? They went. Pray and go. All right. Um, we're going to do it in three phases. The leadership is going to do it first. And... After we do that and tweak it, uh, we're inviting everyone in the congregation, if you will, to walk your own neighborhood and put out door hangers. So, in, on your connection card, on the top where it says, let us know, we're asking people to prayerfully commit how the Lord is uh, tapping you on the shoulder here. So, realizing that God is calling us to pray and go, and the leadership knows it's, that God is calling us to this. I will gladly, and you can check this if you want, walk and pray my neighborhood and deliver door hangers. Number two, I will gladly walk and pray once a month for one hour and deliver door hangers as directed. That's phase number three. Phase one, leadership. Phase two, we do our own neighborhoods. Phase three, whatever else is not covered, uh, our map coordinator, uh, Jerry Van Blarkham, yeah, and I will be uh, determining what areas we will uh, be uh, going in. And we're just asking for a commitment of once a month for one hour. Uh, although we will be walking every week, that will be scheduled because we want to do this consistently um, and uh, be praying for our community consistently. We're only asking that you put in uh, one hour uh, a month. And then the, th the third thing is uh, the prayer response team. Everybody can be on the prayer response team. I will gladly serve on the prayer response team. Trudy Harker is our, our prayer response coordinator. We have already set up the email, which is on the door hanger, pray at northviewchristian.net. You send an email to that, and uh, we will uh, get the requests out to our prayer response team from our community. Literally, we'll be praying for specific needs as they send them to us. And then the second thing is that we will pray for the walkers and their neighborhoods each week. So we'll send out an email and say, we've got walkers going out at this time of day, on this day of the week, please pray for them as they go. And as I said in the middle of the bulletin, if you go to the, almost to the bottom, what will happen 
without our earnest prayers? Nothing. If God's not in this, and we're not knocking on heaven's door, this is just going to simply, we've getting some good exercise. It's like somebody being baptized but not really having faith in Jesus. It's just a nice swim in the water. Dunk. But that's it. Okay? We must pray. So that's, that's the idea here. So how can we pray between now and when we start? That's what's in the bulletin. Those are the bulletin points in there. That's how you can pray. So uh, give your commit, put, uh, put your check, smart, check marks on uh, this sheet and, uh, and pray like crazy for God to move uh, among us. All right. John chapter 6. <clears throat> we all know our world is a mess. Our country, especially our cities, are under siege. And we Christians must realize, we must realize, that the world of the first century in the Bible, that their world was not calm. The Jewish people were, were under the foot of the Romans. It wasn't pleasant. And we should no way equate the religion that we have had in the United States with the atmosphere of the first century. They were an occupied nation. We have enjoyed such peace for years and years and years. To, to, to the freedom to worship as we wish without any pressure, essentially, whatsoever. But that's not the world of the apostles in the first century. And we're becoming a little more acquainted with that. In Acts chapter 4, when we read in our great adventure, Peter and John were arrested for healing the crippled man at the beautiful gate. Persecution started right away after the day of Pentecost. And in chapter 5, they were arrested again by the religious leaders, and they were flogged. Hmm. And then the apostles, first slide, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace. For the name of Jesus. They were suffering disgrace. Thank you Jesus. We're suffering for you. Next slide. And every day in the temple. And from house to house. They continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. So here's the, here's the atmosphere. Persecution on the church. We're going to talk to as many people as we can about Jesus. That was the attitude. And in Acts chapter 6. What happened? Stephen was arrested. What happened in Acts chapter uh, uh, 7? Stephen was killed. Right? So what happens in Acts chapter 8, verse 1? A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So, verse 4. What happened? The believers who were scattered, what did they do? Did they hunker in their homes? Did they say, we're afraid, we're not going to do anything? No, oh, no, 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 no. They scattered and preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. <clears throat> but what else did they do? Verse 25. After testifying and preaching the word of the Lord in Samaria, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem where the pressure was more intense. And we get to chapter 9 where uh, Saul had gotten permission. He was on his way to Damascus. And the Lord knocked him down on that road said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I, who am I persecuting? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And, 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 and Saul gave his heart and life and, and everything that he was to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we get to the end of that chapter and it says, Then the church had peace throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, they also grew in numbers. Amen. So here's the history really quick. Day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes down powerful workings in Acts chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 12 they were under persecution in some way they did not let that 
stop them. Then we get to Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, Herod had James arrested and killed. The first of the apostles to die a martyr. It starts up again. In Acts thir chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas, they're up in Antioch. And uh, they're, the leadership is in prayer and says, send Paul and Barnabas to go start churches. So they fasted and prayed and they sent them. And everywhere they went, everywhere Paul and Barnabas went, Mark was with them at first, every synagogue they went to, they were tossed out. They had harsh uh, uh, conversations with people. And they were stoned and they were whipped and they literally were kicked out of cities. It was only in certain moments that the church experienced peace. Most of the time, it was dealing with persecution from one side or another. Now, it is in this context that John wrote the Gospel of John. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He is called what? The Apostle of Love. You have a culture that is falling apart, literally the Roman culture is falling apart. <clears throat> Let me back up just a hair. In 70 AD, the Romans went in and completely obliterated Jerusalem. So, so now Jerusalem is wiped out. The church is scattered out to north, south, east and west. East and, west. and now Nero is taking Christians and having these garden parties and he's dipping them in oil and burning them on the stake. The, uh, the games that they're having, these wonderful games with these wonderful coliseums, were, they were getting more and more and more violent and bloodthirsty and the, and the more the, the crowds called for the blood, the, the, the more blood there was. And the Christians were involved in that. And it is in this atmosphere that the church is called to love people. Right where they're at. That's what the church is called to. And so in our great adventures, we're reading, is this past week as we read through 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10... And last week, when we read 1 through 5, what did we read? John wrote about how the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, how? Full of grace and truth. In John chapter 3, Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born again to eternal life. In John chapter 4, Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman about living water to eternal life. In chapter 5, Jesus is talking to the Jews about listening to Jesus' words for eternal life. And in John chapter 6, which I have, have you turned to, had you turned to, four times, John writes about Jesus talking about eternal life. John 6, 27. Do not... Be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. That's verse 27. Now we go to verse 40. For it is my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe in Him should have... You say it. Okay. And then in verse 47. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has... And then in John, uh, in verse 54, Jesus says, Anyone who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. And I will raise that person up at the last day. And then at the end of the chapter, we have Peter saying to Jesus, because people are leaving his disciples, not just people, Jesus' disciples, those that were following him have now become so discouraged because Jesus is saying so completely, He is the Messiah. He is the Chosen One. He is the One that has come down from heaven from God. He is the One through whom one has eternal life. They just says, this is too hard of a teaching. We can't eat His flesh and blood. They had no understanding of what He was talking about. And so He turns to the disciples and says, well guys, you guys going to leave too? 
Peter says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So friends, here in the 21st century, as our world gets darker, more unstable, more volatile, the message of the gospel, the good news, becomes greater. Amen. Greater. The more we get pushed to the fringes of society, the less we are recognized by any, anyone or anything, the more we lift up the standard of Jesus Christ and say, He is the eternal life. We must be more devoted to talking to people about the light than we are the darkness. Jeff, what do you mean? The darkness is only a springboard to talk more about the light. Do the things that are happening in the world, in the conversations you have had in this past week, did it lead you to give people the answer that Jesus Christ is the answer? He's the light of the world. He's the one through whom we have eternal life. If we moan and complain about all the things that are happening in the world and do not give the answer to the solution, how in the world are we going to be the people of God? We must be the people of God. We must be people of light. We must pe be people of love. We must be people of grace and truth. This is one of the reasons why our worship, our worship together becomes greater and greater. And that's our goal there at Northview. We want to be a people of grace and love in a volatile world of growing hate. Because that's what Jesus has called all his disciples to be. And he wants us to talk more about eternal life more than we do anything else. And I'm afraid that we're guilty of just the opposite. We need to think about our conversations. Am I pointing people to Jesus? So, right now, let's turn our thoughts to worship. And let's ask the Lord to transform our minds and our hearts into ones that look like Him. That our heart will look like His heart. And that... And that as we celebrate communion together in just a few moments, that we will recognize the call of Christ on our own lives. Let's worship the Lord together.
reconciled us to himself through the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. So on the night that Jesus was portrayed in the upper room when he had uh, the last supper with his disciples, he took the bread and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And also after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the blood of the New Testament. Drink it all of you. So Yesterday, Jeff and I were together, and we was looking over the Pray and Go pamphlet, and uh, we was wondering if it would offend anybody that we pass it out to, and I, I mentioned, Jeff mentioned maybe the, the Muslim community here in town, 
And I said, well, they shouldn't be offended by the cross because they believe in Jesus. And Jeff says, well, they don't believe Jesus was God because God cannot die. He, so they believe that he was a prophet. And Jeff had mentioned that uh, some of the upper echelon and the, uh, the Muslim community is starting to ask maybe he did die and want to know why. And so we went ahead with that. Well, God the Father, Father never died. God the Holy Spirit didn't die. But God the Son did die to redeem us. So let's take our bread and I'll bless it. Heavenly Father, we pray for blessings upon this bread that we're about to partake, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you in his name for sending him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that blessings upon this cup which represents the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. The scripture reading for today is from the book of John, chapter 10, 7 through 14. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All that have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life, and I have it and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd, he does not own the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Let's all pray. God Almighty, we thank you so much for sending your Son to the earth to die for us. And we thank you so much that we can come together once again as a congregation and worship you and spend time with the, with the people of this church. It's, just, it's so important that we congregate and we spend time with those other believers. And I thank you so much for this opportunity once again. And we have a house of believers in one, one row. And Lord, we know that the world is hurting and the world needs your love and care. We just ask that you use this opportunity to open up people's eyes, that they may understand the truth and that you are the truth and the light, and that you want no way to pass away. So Lord, we ask you to continue to bless this service today. We we'll open the eyes and the hearts of everybody who's here and online. It's your son's name, I pray all these blessed things. Amen. Last September, we began the great adventure, <clears throat> starting in July, we're two months from completing it, and we'll have read through every chapter in uh, the New Testament, and we'll have done our A, B, C, Ds. <clears throat> a, you ought to have this memorized by heart now, give it a title, B, what's your best verse, C, what is God's challenge to you, and D, is there a difficulty in this chapter? <clears throat> Everyone at Northview ought to be participating in the great adventure. And I'm going to tell you why. I mean, we're, what, 10 months into it now? Let me tell you why. <clears throat> when in school, to excel, what did you do? You ate, you drank, you breathed, reading, writing, and arithmetic. At least we used to. If you went to college, you ate, you drank, you breathed your major, whether it was business or music or law or medicine or finance. <clears throat> if you were an athlete, you ate, you drank, you breathed your sport. And Jesus says to us in John chapter 7 today, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he talked about how God gave manna every morning 
to their forefathers. The, the 40 years that they were wandering around in the desert, God provided for them this food. Now, God has given you and me Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread to not just physical life, to eternal life. When we get to verse 53, you know what Jesus was saying? When he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, listen, you have no life in you. Whoever, who, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So, do you know what Jesus is saying there? He's not, not, not specifically, secondarily. What Jesus is saying is, you need to eat, drink, and breathe me. Like we devote ourselves to wholly consuming a subject or a, uh, a path in life. Or a way that we're going to earn money. Something by which we can excel in something. Jesus says, I need to be your daily everything. And when we read the word of God, what are we reading? The bread of life. What do we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Most of us are thinking about hamburgers. But Jesus is saying... I want to be your bread. What is it that Jesus told the disciples? Hey, you want something to eat? No, I have, I've already, you know, my food is, is to do what? The will of God. Oh, boy. It, it, it is a kind of a tough thing to understand what Jesus is saying. But he's saying devote your time, your energy, your resources, your thoughts, your dreams, your goals to me. Inclusive in that is the Lord's Supper, which we partook, which we... And he, but that didn't come until... Later on, I mean, he didn't even institute that until the night before he was crucified, right? All right. So Jesus was talking about here and now, you need to eat me. Disciples started leaving. <clears throat> then he asked this question, <laughs> poignant question. Does this offend you? And let me tell you, it offends people. It offends people when they learn that Jesus wants everything. You know, well, I believe in Jesus. Okay, so are you, are you uh, making choices by which everything in your life <clears throat> lines up with his will? Well, no, but I believe in him. And then he'll forgive everything just because I believe. Folks, the demons believe. The demons not only believe, they tremble because they know who he is. Obedience is the factor that, that they sadly lack. <clears throat> and in our world, excuse me, <clears throat> in our world there is no problem with devoting oneself to business and music and law and sport and medicine and finance. But how about Jesus? Oh, Jeff, don't go overboard. Don't go too far. Can you go too far with Jesus? No. Oh, it's impossible. You can become overbearing. If Jesus was an over, overbearing person, the sinners wouldn't have liked him. And what was he? He was, the, he was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. So we need to balance those things out. So in this section that we read this week, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, there are four of the seven... I am's in the book of John. There are seven times Jesus says, I am. The first one is, I am the bread of life. The second one is, I am the light of the world. And you'll find that in John chapter 8, verses 12 and, uh, 8, 12 and chapter 9, verse 5. <clears throat> Remember Jesus said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Life is very confusing. Sometimes life is overwhelming. Matter of fact, you may be in an overwhelming period, season in your life right now. Someone at home, 
maybe something has just really crippled you emotionally. Accidents happen. Jobs are lost. Loved ones die. We have big choices to make and we don't know what the right one is. We have bad habits to overcome. Problems to solve. Life can be out of control, which is none of our doing. Things just happen and it's, out of, it's flying off the tracks. Health issues. I can't sleep issues. Worries. Concerns. What Jesus is saying in being the light of the world is that he truly is the answer to our greatest and to our deepest needs by being our light. In verse 31, Jesus said, "If you 731, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth. Do you know this verse? You will know the truth. What's the truth going to do for you? The truth will... Set you free. Oh, isn't that a great verse? Oh, by the way, did you pick up your promise card? I have a thousand papers on my pad here, on my stand, and one of them is a promise card. But hold up the promise cards. There you are. That's the first verse on there, right? There you go. You will be free indeed. Now look at the second one. And if the sun sets you free, guess what? You will be free indeed. I want to tell you about the meanest man in Texas. I love when Joe Garman of ARM uh, Prison Ministry tells this story. Clyde Thompson was the son of a minister. After boyhood, he never went to church and he became a very extremely mean person. He was out hunting one day, met some men in the woods, and he killed two of those men. He was found, arrested, incarcerated, and he was put on death row in Huntsville, Texas. The last place you want to be in Texas in that day and time was Huntsville, Texas on death row. It was one bad place. It was legendary. While on death row during recreation time, Clyde Thompson killed two more men. He was so mean that the guards took him off death row and put him in the morgue. Put a steel door on it with a four inch square window in it. Six hours a day, there would be light that would come through that little window. He ranted and raved like a wild animal in this solitary confinement. If the guards got close enough to that little window, he would spit at them. He was sane. He was just plain old mean. As the years passed, it was the prisoners that nicknamed Clyde the meanest man in Texas. Well, God has his people everywhere, even in Huntsville, Texas. One day a guard said, Clyde, you don't have anything to read. If I give you a Bible, I'll give, you know, he says, I'll give you a Bible if you promise not to tear it up. Clyde said, well, I don't have anything to read. So give me the Bible. So during the six hours of light, he would read scripture. And then, all the rest of the time when it was not light, he would try to remember what it was that he read. There was no evangelists. There was no sermons. It was just the word of God shining his light into Clyde's soul. And the guards began noticing a change in Clyde. So much so that, that he was released from the morgue to go back to death row. And on death row, over a period of time, he immersed eight prisoners into Christ. And again, over time, the change was so dramatic that he was allowed to go get off of death row and be among the general population. He became the chaplain's right-hand man. Eventually, Texas gave him a lifetime parole. Meaning he had to have his weekly check-ins, as, and as long as he didn't break the law, he could stay outside. So where did Clyde Thompson go? He went to Lubbock County Jail, and he started a chaplain program there. 
And he will go down in God's record book as one of the greatest soul winners this generation has ever known. He led hundreds of men and women, boys and girls, out of the streets of alcoholism and drugs to the foot of the cross of Jesus. Clyde was transformed by the light of the world. And anyone you know can be transformed by the light of the world too. You see, what Clyde did was he ate, he drank, and he breathed the bread of life, the word of God, the light of the world. The next thing Jesus said is that he called himself the gate. I am the gate in John chapter 10, verses 7 and verses 9. <clears throat> Therefore Jesus said again, Truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. And whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in, they will go out, they will find pasture. The thief only comes in to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Going back to Clyde Thompson once again. And any other sinner that we know. We can learn of Jesus and when we learn of Jesus we in, and give our hearts to him. We enter through him, the gate, into eternal life. To enter the gate means to believe so much that Jesus is the answer to your life's problems. That you will surrender your hopes, your dreams, your quest for happiness, and your security to Him. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. To surrender. To throw up your hands. This is what it means to believe in Jesus. You throw up your hands and say, I am giving up my life. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. I'm giving up my life to Him. And so we get to the next thing that Jesus calls Himself in John 10. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. And this is why we can trust Jesus with our lives too. Even the most broken down of a life, you can give to Jesus. So I'm going to ask you a question. Is God tugging on your heart today? Is God tugging on your heart about a broken life that you know of? That you can take to them the bread of life? That you can take to that person some light so they can see beyond their circumstances and see Jesus? Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. So here's what we tell people. Jesus really does care for you. No matter what the problems are, Jesus cares for you. There is nothing so broken and there is nothing so bad in your life that Jesus can't heal it. He can. Do you believe that? He can. See, a good shepherd cares for his sheep. He's concerned for his sheep. He protects his sheep. And without him, the sheep would be lost. So when we make the Lord our shepherd, we shall not want. Because he takes us to green pastures to eat. And he takes us to still waters to rest. And he restores our broken, tired twisted, shallow souls with his healing. And then he guides our steps to right living. And even though we walk through valleys of death and we face fierce enemies, we are no longer afraid because our shepherd is with us. He's leading. He's guiding. He's guarding. He's protecting. He's feeding and watering our souls even 
in the darkness of the night when we can't sleep. We trust in Jesus because he laid down his life for us so that we can truly live. Truly live. So, let's give our lives and our souls to him, our good shepherd. Let him heal our souls. Let him give us strength and wisdom for our lives and for our times. Let's give ourselves to the Lord and, and open ourselves and receive his peace in our lives so that we become peacemakers, even online. You see much peacemaking going on online, if you're online, no matter what the social media is. Peacemakers are the way of Jesus. Clyde Thompson became a peacemaker. You know, being a peacemaker is a tough task. It is not flowers. It is not honey bread. It's hard. Because what do you have to bring peace to? You have to bring peace to turmoil. That's hard. And it's tough. And usually there's a lot of anger involved. And I love Proverbs, I think it's chapter 18, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. Maybe it's 16.1. Maybe it's 19.1. I got a thought. Read all the Proverbs and you'll find it. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So let's let Jesus bring his I am's into our lives and receive him as we surrender our wills to his life. Next week we cover, cover the last three I am's and they're great. But for now, it's about each of us surrendering to the Lord. Let's do that as we sing the song in worship. song is great I am how great the Lord is as we sing this song we're thinking about how he is the bread of life <clears throat> the light of the world the gate and the good shepherd
this all stand. <laughs> oh, Father God, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for your healing. We thank you that you are our everything, and you explain that to us through your word today. Oh, Lord, may every person here, as we leave this place, may our hearts be filled with your glory and with your grace and with your truth and the power of your word. Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to lift you up high in our lives this week. In Jesus' name, we all say and pray. Amen. 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 And now we're going to sing. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see. We want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see. We want to see. We want to see Jesus.